Hello there, Cincinnati Public Radio listeners, and thank you for tuning in to the special Juneteenth feature of the Urban Roots podcast. We're your hosts. I'm historic preservationist Deborah Hussein Wetzel, and I'm City's journalist Vanessa Cork. If you haven't heard of the Urban Roots podcast before, we are a production of Urbanist Media, which is a nonprofit with a mission to elevate the voices of people of color and preserve the places significant to them. For us, preservation isn't just about the tangible. We use the podcast to preserve places through story. And today we are so excited that Cincinnati Public Radio has invited us to celebrate Juneteenth by airing two episodes from our first season, all about Cincinnati. First up, you'll hear Cincinnati History is Black History, our prelude to the first season. So our story begins here in Cincinnati in 1820, and our protagonist is a barber named John Hatfield. John was a black man from Pennsylvania who had come to Ohio looking for work in the steamboat industry. A lot of people were moving to Cincinnati around that time. Cincinnati was the sixth most populous city in the U.S. in 1840. John was one of those many, many people who came here looking for work at the time. And he really did well for himself. Census records show that by 1840, John, his wife, and his children, and nine of his employees lived with him at his barber shop in downtown Cincinnati. But what the census didn't show was John's other life. Aha, okay, I figured there had to be more to this story. Yeah. When John Hatfield would cut clients' hair, he'd get them all relaxed and comfortable. And then he was snipping and shaving and shaving and snipping, and he'd listen, gathering information. John, you see, was a covert agent for the Underground Railroad. Sounds really dangerous. Incredibly dangerous, indeed. And when the Fugitive Slave Law passed in 1850, the work became even more so. Slave catchers could now follow runaways to free states. So even free blacks could be captured and then sold into slavery. And so in 1853, word got to John Hatfield that 28 African-American men and women who had escaped from Kentucky had been stranded in Cincinnati. He knew he would have to act fast. Right. I mean, getting 28 people across state borders, that sounds impossible. So how did he do it? Well, I recently went somewhere here in Cincinnati to find out. Hey, good morning. I'm Decca. I'm Kathy. Kathy, nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you. I met historian Kathy Dahl at Wesleyan Cemetery. It's a big green cemetery in Northside Cincinnati, a place that is usually pretty serene, quiet, and contemplative. And obviously today is mowing day, which I didn't know. Well, considering that they only mow like four times a year, we're happy when they do it. Wait, really? They don't come like every week? Nope. If Kathy's right, there is literally a 1% chance in a year that you would show up on mowing day. Oh, man, yeah. We were absolutely not lucky. But Kathy and I persevered. She told me that Wesleyan was founded in 1843 and is known for some pretty awesome things. Mm -hmm. One was that it was pretty unique and interracial. White and black folks could both be buried here. And secondly, it's known because of its role in the escape of the 28. Like, it was a really big deal. Right. Okay, yeah, let's get back to this escape. So who were these 28? All right. So, yeah, these people were 28 enslaved men, women, and children who hooked up with the abolitionist John Fairfield. They started out in Kentucky, where Mm -hmm. Fairfield posed as a rich poultry dealer to sneak them out of the state. Then they followed the banks of the Ohio River. And at one point, get this. They stole a little boat to help them cross the river into Indiana. But then the boat sunk. And then they ended up having to wade through the river, which not only got them completely off schedule, it left them cold, muddy, exhausted, and bloody shoeless. And and to make matters worse, they get wind that they're being pursued by bounty hunters. So the situation is dire. And while they're hiding, John Fairfield goes into Cincinnati and then looks up John Hatfield. And he's like, yo, I need your help. We need a plan to somehow get these folks out of here in the middle of the day. 
Right. How do you how do you do that in the middle of the day? Like 28 people? <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty ingenious that they decided to throw a fake funeral at Wesleyan. A fake funeral. A fake funeral. Okay. They sent a bunch of buggies to the fugitives where they were hiding. And it, it took them up the road towards a cemetery. And Hatfield and his churchgoers went like one step further, though. And John Hatfield, it was his congregation and his family that helped surround this procession to make it look more legitimate, like a funeral procession. These were African-American people, free African-Americans, who stood the most to lose if they got caught. That's pretty, you know, I get goosebumps. <laughs> oh man, I get goosebumps too. So what happened, Decca? Did they make it? Yes. Yeah, so after the funeral, they hid with some black families and then continued along the Underground Railroad until they eventually made it to Canada. In the end, they walked 600 miles, and it was the largest documented successful escape ploy in the Northwest Territory. That is awesome. So is Hatfield also buried in Wesleyan? Like, did you go visit his grave when you were there? N no, but, but I absolutely asked. <laughs> yeah. And, and I found out very quickly that Hatfield actually ended up moving to and passing away in Australia. But I did ask Kathy if she could take me to some notable African-American graves from this time period within Wesleyan. She took me to the so-called colored area. But unfortunately, there really wasn't much so, there. Finding earlier, which you're talking about, 1870 stones yeah. for African-Americans in this section are probably very far okay. and few. And if they were, they may not even be an upright. Upright yep. is more expensive. It would be like this. If this is not cleaned off regularly, plants will grow on top. You know, that's... that's, so that's where you're like, you know, things could be under this grass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. As evidenced by the lack of mowing days, Wesleyan is already a place in need of more loving care. But this part of the cemetery, which is right by the noisy highway, felt even more run down than the other sections. The history is literally in danger of being buried here, which kind of pisses me off, to be honest. And especially because this is the colored area, it just seems like it would be very important to, for them to just maintain. Yeah, just to like a little bit more care, right? They don't have to care a whole lot, just a little bit more. And when I got into the car, I started talking to my husband about how much history is here. History we never knew about. Even though we'd literally driven by this place a million times before. The history is super interesting. I didn't know anything about this place. That's cool. No. Drive by it all the time and had no idea. Here, look to your right. This is what you see, but you're passing on a highway so fast that you have no idea what exists, you know, around you. Yeah. There's something magical about that for me when it comes to like talking about history. These stories aren't always apparent or easy to find, but they're so important to unearth. And finding these stories, stories in danger of being forgotten, that's exactly why we're doing this show. Welcome to Urban Roots, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the little known stories from urban history. We're your hosts. I'm Vanessa Quirk. And I'm Daphne Hussein Wetzel. And we're so excited to kick off our first season with an in depth look at the rich African American history of my hometown, Cincinnati. You can think of this episode as a kind of prelude of sorts. We're going to go back, way back, to Cincinnati's beginnings and explore how race and racism shaped the city from the start. And we'll see how throughout the city's history, African-American communities have always banded together to not only persevere, but thrive, despite the adversity. History is the key, as I tell folks. If you don't know where you came from, you definitely don't know where you are, and you surely don't know where you're going. That's Dr. Eric Jackson, an expert on the African-American history that has shaped Cincinnati. I am Dr. Eric Jackson, professor of history at Northern Kentucky University and also director of the Black Studies program. For those unfamiliar with Cincy, the city is bounded by big hills to the north and the Ohio River to the south. Cross the river and you're in Kentucky. 
When Cincinnati was founded in 1788, Ohio was a free state. Kentucky was not. But that doesn't mean that African Americans were welcome to Ohio with open arms. Ohio never was an enslavement state. It was a so-called free state. But at the same time, it instituted segregation laws as early as 1804, with what are called the Black Codes. In 1805, the Black Codes, which forced African Americans who moved to Ohio, Cincinnati specifically, to pay the state a security deposit of $500 to ensure what was called good conduct. When you said the $500 security deposit, I was on mute, but I went, Buh, because like that, <laughs> that, mu- that must have been a huge amount of money in this time. So was that a common way to kind of enforce, I guess, like essentially prevent African-Americans from, to, from coming to Ohio? That was, the, that was the objective of the Black Codes, which didn't stop them from coming because it was better than what they experienced other places that were defined as the South. And as African-Americans settled in this free city across the river from an enslavement state, a network of freedom fighters grew. Cincinnati becomes, uh, again, one of the major routes of the Underground Railroad. Some historians argue that 60 percent of folks who escaped the South using the Underground Railroad came through Cincinnati. So some folks stayed in Cincinnati once they came. You had... Um, two basic communities in Cincinnati that starts to develop. One was called Little Africa and one was called Bucktown. And those two places were a mixture of free African-Americans who had traveled to Cincinnati, fugitive African-Americans who decided to stay in Cincinnati, and folks who were already of African-Americans who were born in Cincinnati as free people of color. And so those communities of Bucktown and Little Africa, they start to become a linchpin for uh, other African Americans to travel there, to get jobs there, to educate themselves there. But as Cincinnati's industry grew and the city's population expanded, white and black racial tensions heightened. And so the perception was African Americans were traveling, migrating to Cincinnati and taking jobs away from whites, particularly poor whites. And so the system had navigated and and manipulated poor whites into believing that that folks of African descent were coming into the city stealing their jobs. And so a riot occurred, first one in 1829. There's another one in the 1830s. There's another one in the 1840s. There's another one in the 1850s. And then it's like every decade up until the start of the Civil War, there's an urban riot in Cincinnati. The 1841 riot was particularly vicious. Apparently, a drought and heat wave combined. It dried up the river, slowed down all work, and stirred up a lot of anger. A band of white Kentuckians crossed the river and started to attack any African Americans in their path. And then a mob of white Cincinnatians joined in, shooting cannons, and black men tried to defend themselves and their families with with muskets and rifles. Local officials took over 300 African-American men to jail for, quote, their own protection. But that left women, children, and homes very vulnerable. People were beaten, homes and stores were destroyed, and after the riots, some African Americans decided to get out of downtown completely. And small pockets of Black communities moved to the more rural villages surrounding Cincinnati. But others, people like John Hatfield, the one who helped the 28 escape, stayed in Cincinnati and responded to the riots by joining groups and forming institutions designed to protect African Americans. Institutions like the Zion Baptist Church located downtown at the time, which was one of the unofficial headquarters of the Underground Railroad. Hatfield also joined something called the Cincinnati Vigilance Committee. Ostensibly, the committee was formed to keep neighborhoods safe and help newly arrived African-Americans find jobs and housing. Covertly, however, the committee was actively involved in helping Black freedom seekers escape the South. Most of these institutions were, again, located in Bucktown and Little Africa, where most of the city's African-Americans lived at the time. That was, that is, until the city of Cincinnati decided it was time to develop downtown. City leaders 
want to figure out a way to start developing downtown Cincinnati, but only for a certain group of people. And the certain group of people are people who look like them. And they're not talking about poor whites and they're not talking about African-Americans. At the time, most of the city's poor Irish and German laborers were working in the West End neighborhood, where the meatpacking industry was located. It was a poor and densely packed place. And so they developed a, a plan on how to develop the city and how to force migrate African Americans to the West End by not giving them the opportunity to buy land in other parts of the city that was growing. As African Americans were forced into the West End, its white population diminished and moved on to other parts of Cincinnati. And over time, the Black community starts to make the West End their own. They start to develop Black churches. They start to develop their own types of educational system. They start to develop their own civic clubs and societies. So they take the the way they're driven into the West End and they create their own institutions to take care of themselves. And they prosper. I mean, they prosper mightily. They create their own businesses, their own stores, their own entertainment. People want to talk about the Cotton Club in, in New York. There's a Cotton Club in Cincinnati. It was the center of the black culture, you know. All of your sororities and, uh, and uh, fraternities gave their dances there. All of your private clubs gave their dances there through the week. Most people, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, you know. And uh, the, that was the hub of everything. There's multiple theaters and um, performances in the West End. I mean, it's a vibrant community. It's a vibrant part of the city for African Americans. When people migrate to Cincinnati during the Great Migration in the early 1900s, they end up in the West End not because it's it's um, as a happenstance. They hear that the West End is the place to go because everything they need is in the West End. For decades, the West End was synonymous with Black Cincinnati. But then... Another city plan was developed, the Cincinnati City Council's 1948 Urban Development Plan. During the late 1940s, the city of Cincinnati announced its urban renewal plans for the West End. Rapidly deteriorating housing, overcrowded living conditions, and a multitude of other urban ills were cited as the reasons behind the urban renewal plan. And around that same time, the Federal Highway Act was passed, which called for an interstate highway that would cut through Cincinnati. And the chosen location? Say it with me now. The The West West End. End. So the interstate cuts the West End in half and demolishes about half of the economic development that African Americans have created for decades. The same thing happens in Detroit at the same time. The interstate cuts through the Black community in Detroit. The same thing happens in Charlotte, North Carolina. So... Cincinnati is not the only city that goes through this same pattern. Uh, when there's an interstate that needs to be created, the land that's acquired to do it by the federal government tends to come from the black community. So when a highway comes in and, and breaks down the vibrancy of, of the West End, um, African-Americans have to f- figure out a different community to migrate to. In our next episodes, we're going to pick up where Dr. Jackson left off and explore three neighborhoods where African Americans settled, Avondale, Evanston, and South Cumminsville. But we felt it was important to start here, with this early history, because these themes repeat again and again. Exactly. I mean, these themes of top-down planning versus bottom-up resistance, basically, a resilience. I mean, that's a consistent theme throughout the whole season. That's another really important thing to note, because it's because of these different struggles with development plans or highways or street widenings in the past, 
you know, it's why Cincinnati feels so disconnected today. All 52 neighborhoods each feel so divided in their own way. But one of the things that I do really love about the Wesleyan Cemetery story that that you brought to, to the show, Decca, is that like it really gets us something else that we're going to see, you know, throughout the season, like the sense of support networks, like churches, organizations that connect you know people to each other people helping each other out forming those bridges like that's a really powerful thing that is also inherent from the start of Cincinnati's history it's these stories that I find probably most fascinating and might have the most trouble finding information on in general Mm -hmm. you know they're like the hidden stories the ones we're trying to pull out from the archives and stuff and piecing things together I want to look at the records for Zion Baptist Church and I want to know more about that because you know it's just incredible that that church was able to play a role in the Underground Railroad movement and but then what do we know about it who knows about that like Let's take a poll, you know, like. (laughs) Right, 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 right. Yeah. And that's like a huge part of why this project has been like important to us, right? Like we've been reaching out to people in communities, asking about what they remember, asking them what their elders taught them, you know, what they told them about what they remember, because so much of this history, unfortunately, has just been lost to time, right? A lot of it isn't in archives. Living in Cincinnati, I I did not know half of these stories until I started working on this project. And I knew this was going to be very, very important to do. Totally. But I had no idea how in- impactful it would be just to me. Yeah. And and hopefully it gives other people like a sense of pride in Cincinnati too, you know, because like for me personally, I had never really thought about the fact that, you know, the geography of Cincinnati, the fact that it is on this border of North and South would make it so pivotal to really American history. Yeah. And, and honestly, as a Cincinnatian, I get super annoyed sometimes <laughs> because Cincinnati is always portrayed as this mediocre place <laughs> right. like, precisely because it's so, you know, in the middle of things. Yeah. But it really is not that way at all. I really right. don't think people appreciate how special this city is because we're in the middle, because right. it's a hodgepodge of people. Like yeah. we're at this nexus point of so many cultures and histories. And there is so much more diversity here than people will realize. And so it's really been inspiring to have witnessed all of this firsthand through this project. Totally. Welcome back to Urban Roots. Thank you for listening to our first episode. Cincinnati history is Black history. If you tuned in late, don't worry. To catch you up, we are the Urban Roots podcast team. I'm City's journalist, Vanessa Quirk. And I'm historic preservationist, Deva Hussein Wetzel. We've partnered with Cincinnati Public Radio to bring you this Juneteenth special. Two of our Urban Roots podcast episodes all about Cincinnati. You just heard our prelude episode to the first season, which explored Cincinnati's early African-American history. Next up is one of our neighborhood episodes where we take you to the rock star community that is South Cumminsville. The residents of South Cumminsville were so welcoming, kind, and really just impressed us with all they do to make their community a place they feel proud of. So please enjoy episode four of season one of Urban Roots, South Cumminsville, for the love of the neighborhood. My name is Tim Kennedy, and I've been living in Southfield for 59 years, and I want to take y'all around the neighborhood to show y'all where I grew up at. Tim Kennedy knows everybody in South Cumminsville. It's partly because he grew up here, but it's also thanks to the kind of work he does. Tim is the president of the South Cumminsville Community Council. But before that, back in 2011, he and some friends started an annual event, the South Cumminsville Family Reunion Picnic. We started out, we had like maybe 50 people, whatever. Then we, the last one we had was 2019, and we had over 500 people. Tim offered to take me around so I could talk with some of the folks in the neighborhood. When we went out, it was early spring. Trees were starting to bud, and you could hear how alive the community was. There were people playing music, mowing lawns, dogs were barking, and kids were playing at the park. As we were walking, Tim recognized someone across the street. Daryl Williams was raised in South Cumminsville and moved back just a few years ago. I asked him what he used to do for fun. Oh, we would do anything from uh, pick apples and ray people's cherry trees and play in the creek. This used to be a pool over here when I was growing up, in that parking lot with a pool. 
That was a school and there was a pool in that parking lot and fitting on the pool. That was the first restaurant my grandfather took me to with Mr. G. The hot dog place? Yep. I thought every hot dog was 12 feet long. <laughs> Deco, what is this magical place that has 12 foot long hot dogs? Jean's hot dogs? Well, it's a stand that's been neighborhood staple for years. People love Mr. Jean's. But unfortunately, it's one of the only few neighborhood buildings still around for people's childhoods. As Tim and I walked to the corner of Elmore Street and Beekman Avenue, he pointed out a large three-story building. Everybody went to this school, elementary school right here. So before, there wasn't no bridge. You can just cross the street. But the street wasn't this wide. See what we got right now? It was all houses going all the way down. Houses aren't the only thing that have disappeared in South Cumminsville. Stores have too. As we walked by vacant lots and empty storefronts, Tim pointed out where the drugstore used to be and a grocery store called Faye's Market. Back in the day, you could get fresh produce at Faye's. Now, it's a beer and cigarette place. As we were walking down the street, we ran into none other than the vice president of the South Cumminsville Community Council, Derek Fagan. He told me that over his lifetime, the neighborhoods changed for the worse. This whole street had another grocery store, barber shop, uh, bars. At the end of the street, another grocery store on each corner. And it was a real vibrant community. Even up in here, all this went all the way through. So what happened to this vibrant community? Well, Derek blames the highway, which tore this community in half. Actually, it killed the community. They tore the entire street down, all the way down to Corain. They eliminated the entire neighborhood. As we left Derek and the highway, we walked by a row of neatly kept two-story single-family houses with nice yards. And Tim stopped at a house he recognized. Look at all. Can we come on in? All right. Once inside, Tim introduced me to two sisters, Annie Williams and Alberta Warden. My name is Annie Williams. What's your What's your name, Annie? Alberta Al- Warden. Are you Are you from South Cummingsville, born and raised? Yes, we were not actually born and raised. I was born in the West End. Okay. We moved out here in 1960. I was in the sixth grade when our family moved from West End on Charlotte Street yeah. out here on Draymond, right across from Jean's Hot Dog. The home, the house is no longer there. We all sat down at a long dining room table with the smell of roast chicken coming from the kitchen. And I asked Alberta and Annie to describe South Cumminsville. Um, well, it does, it's not that warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, no, that you once had same growing same. up. It always was like a more like a, a family a community because you know, everybody knew family. everybody. In our community, when we grew up, if you did something and, and so and so say, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to get you. I'm going to tell, you, oh, tell your mama. I'm going to tell your mama. And then and she, she wouldn't talk, she wouldn't call it. Yeah. Yeah. Tipped out here acting a fool. And then they, they get on it, you know. Yeah. But the, the, the whole community, I think, we're caring about all the youth. Well, everybody you get along. That. If you can't get along, you, you, you can't do nothing. But Annie and Alberta told me that thanks to the highway, their close-knit community just isn't what it used to be. Oh, yeah, because there was well, homes. that expressway. They tore our homes all along that stretch on oh, Beacon yeah. where 74 is running mm-hmm. now. I know the good 25 homes they right. took down, they just took tore down, down to mm-hmm. make the interstate from access from 74 to come through the neighborhood. They divided the community. Then they actually had to just cut off our sure dead end boarding. Our boarding gonna, we walked that straight. I had That's friends right. on the other side of boarding. Right. And you got what? I gotta walk across the bridge? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they no. get to somebody's house? Yeah. And then they dead end dreaming down. So they just locked us in, basically. Locked they in. locked us in. Welcome to Urban Roots, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the little known stories of urban history. We're your hosts. I'm Vanessa Quirk. And I'm Dale Hussein Wetzel. And welcome to the third and final installment of our Lost Voices of Cincinnati series. In this episode, we're taking a tour of South Cumminsville's past and present. It's a community that, like a lot of Black neighborhoods in Cincinnati, has been divided and, over time, diminished. But it's also a place with a long, long history of Black entrepreneurship, Black ownership, and Black churches place where, from the beginning, residents have fought to improve their community and support each other. Exactly. Which is why we're going to start this episode way back when, before South Cumminsville was even a part of Cincinnati, and tell you the story of someone named Sarah Fawcett. I 
I, I think she really was one of the uncredited change makers in Cincinnati that really defined what the black community could look like legally and economically. That's Sean Andres. Sean is the co-founder of this boss blog called Queens of Queen City, which seeks to uncover the stories of important women in Cincinnati's history. That, that sounds awesome. They're kind of like kindred spirits of ours. Yeah, absolutely. Queens of Queen City is actually how I first came across Sarah Fawcett. There's so much unknown about her that I really want to find and uncover and let the world know because this woman is incredible. Sean has been digging around the archives, trying to find out everything he can about her. Uh, I do know that she comes from a family of enslaved people and she was born in 1826. While Sarah was likely born in South Carolina, she was sent to New Orleans as a young girl. There she studied under a French hairstylist. She became very good at what she did. And so she became a top-notch hairstylist. So she, was sought out after by elite white society. Once Sarah got to Cincinnati in the 1840s, word spread quickly about her mad hairstyling skills. Soon enough, Sarah had a little hair empire on her hands. Sarah became part of Cincinnati's black elite, and she became pretty politically active too. This elite black society that was doing their own thing, being super successful, and there were still advocating for black rights. It was more than abolition. They were fighting for justice. They were fighting for equality. They were doing so much here in Cincinnati that really would later on inspire the national platforms. And Sarah was very much a part of that. While she was running in these elite abolitionist circles in the early 1850s, she met Peter Farley Fawcett, the man she would soon marry. Peter was renowned for his culinary skills. In fact, Peter learned how to cook from his mother, a woman who had been enslaved by Thomas Jefferson and who used to run the kitchen at Monticello. And later on, they would open their own catering business, which Sarah would also get involved with. And they became the most successful catering business in Cincinnati. Peter and Sarah were true equals in marriage and in business. Sarah and Peter were also equally devoted to their activism. They were almost definitely involved in the Underground Railroad, but we can't definitively prove it because there is so little evidence because of the dangers of being a conductor on the Underground Railroad. It was even dangerous being an abolitionist. You, you had to hide behind a lot of smoke screens. But Sarah certainly did not live in the shadows. By all accounts, she was an exuberant person, always out and about in the community, helping where she could. She was almost this social butterfly. People respected her. Even white people respected her. And she was gifted things all the time. She was gifted this silk quilt that had an insane amount of squares. And so each square represented one of her friends. So it was 186 squares. So you would see her as really the pillar of the community. That's so sweet. I know. <laughs> That's such a sweet story. I know. While Sarah Fawcett may have been known for her sweetness, it was her courage that changed the course of Cincinnati's history. But you'll have a hard time finding that story in the history books. The story begins in 1862. Sarah was late to an appointment to an upper-class white woman's hair for her wedding. And so she was running, 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 trying to get there. And she thought, you know what? I'm going to get on this, this streetcar for white people. And so she did. <laughs> this was still the early days of streetcars, when they were still being pulled by horses. Even before the streetcar became electrified in the 1890s, the invention was a really big deal for Cincinnati. It's what allowed the city to grow and expand beyond the downtown. And it allowed people who weren't rich enough to own their own horses to get around Cincinnati like never before. Well, not all people. It was for white people. It would have depended on primarily the streetcar. It was up to the streetcar. So streetcars have the ability to deny black people um, seats. Sarah tried getting on to the platform, but was stopped by the conductor. 
he started trying to push her off. And Sarah held onto the rails as the horses were starting to move. And so she was gripping tightly, fearing for the fall. She could have been trampled. She could have been ran over by the wheel. And these, these streetcars were heavy. She could have been plowed over by horses. So while she was gripping for her life, the conductor was hitting her hands to try to remove her. And so she tried to bite his knuckles as he tried to pry her hands off, finger by finger. And she's just trying to bite his hands. After three blocks, three entire blocks fighting the conductor and holding on for her life, Sarah let go. Thankfully, she survived, but not without suffering some major injuries. And while she recovered, she decided to do something about the injustice done to her. So she sued the railroad company for $1,000 in damages. She didn't receive the $1,000. However, she did get $65 for being refused passage. It may sound like a paltry result, but the ruling actually had really meaningful ramifications for African Americans in Cincinnati because the case set the legal precedent for a more integrated streetcar system. As a result of this case, Black women and children were legally allowed to ride inside of a streetcar while Black men could ride outside of them. Do you think that part of the reason why she decided to press charges was because of her position in, in the community? I really do. I, I really do think that she kept on for three blocks for that reason. I, everything she did was for the community. This was no exception. I think this was a moment that really defined the rest of her life in how she and even how Peter would would operate in society. You can tell that there's this justice element to Peter and Sarah in their work. And that, I think, definitely was sparked by this. If you people will listen to me, it was after this pivotal moment in their lives that Sarah and Peter moved to one of Cincinnati's newest neighborhoods, Cumminsville. Cumminsville encapsulated what today we know as Northside and South Cumminsville. It was mostly rural at the time, but had many abolitionist churches and colleges, making it an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Until the streetcar arrived, it had been pretty removed from the rest of Cincinnati. It wasn't even annexed into the city until 1873. And it's around this time that Peter and Sarah both got involved in starting a local church, the First Baptist Church of Cumminsville. It was the first church in Cincinnati to be built and financed by African Americans. It was central to a Black way of life. Black churches in Cincinnati in particular were places not just of worship, but of social consciousness and justice. This church, the Baptist church, was really the foundations of making Cincinnati so much better for Black people, so much more livable, and really provided opportunities through Sarah's organization and Peter's leadership. Sarah and Peter didn't just use their money for the church. They used it to build up the new neighborhood they called home. They were both buying property in their own names, leasing it, and they were really developing the community through their own money. And Sarah continued to develop her neighborhood, even after Peter passed away. After Peter died, she inherited all of his money. And by the time she died, just a few years later, almost all of that money was gone. So she had donated it all back to the community. So she was deeply invested in the well-being and equality of the Black community in Cincinnati. Thanks in no small part to Sarah and Peter's investments, Cumminsville became home to a small but vibrant community of working-class African-American families, mostly around Follett and Dreamin' Avenues. And that's mostly how it stayed, for decades, until two milestones in Cincinnati history changed Cumminsville forever. First, as we talked about in our prelude episode, mid-century urban renewal practices demolished whole swaths of the West End, where the majority of Cincinnati's Black population lived at the time. 
After what happened in the West End, African Americans throughout the city were forced to relocate. So they moved to places where they had ties, neighborhoods like Evanston, Avondale, and Cumminsville, which had these small black communities. By the 1950s, Cumminsville was predominantly African American. But almost as soon as it became a black neighborhood, the city of Cincinnati started buying up property, including the land that held the First Baptist Church. And they started tearing down the buildings. Which takes us to the second thing that shaped Cumminsville's future, the Interstate Highway. Like the streetcar before it, I-74 was made for white people to get around. It allowed them to speedily get to downtown from their homes in the suburbs. But it wasn't really designed for the black residents of South Cumminsville, then or now. The highway completely disrupted the fabric of this neighborhood, replacing homes and stores and gardens with asphalt and speeding dirty cars. Cumminsville became two neighborhoods. North Side, where many stores and homes continued to develop, and South Cumminsville, which was a more industrial neighborhood with factories and companies. South Cumminsville was also where most African Americans lived and worshipped. But because of the highway, the neighborhood was separated from so much that used to be a part of the community. But the highway wasn't the only reason why South Cumminsville started to decline in the 60s and 70s. While we were on our tour, Tim Kennedy wanted me to talk to someone who remembered this part of South Cumminsville's history particularly well. My brother, right down the porch. Now, he know everything. Okay, cool. Now, when he was coming up, it was none like this. Man, so much has changed, right? I know. Yeah. Wilbur Kennedy owned a construction company in South Cumminsville for many years. But before that, he was a politically active youth. I, well, the first sit-in I went to was, I was in the 10th grade at Hughes High School. And uh, it was about the Vietnam War. I just walked in school, we sit down. And when we sit down in the hallway, all the teachers came down and they recognized us. For the next week, the whole school was taught about why the war was going on and what was going on in the war and everything. And that was our first, my first sit-in. As Wilbur got older and the 60s progressed, he got more radical in his politics. I used to be a black panther. And we had a meeting one time out in Lincoln Heights with H.R.F. Brown was there. And H.R.F. Brown said, burn, baby, burn. And somebody said, why are we burning up our own neighborhoods and not burning up their neighborhoods? And H.R.F. Brown said, I don't care what they do in their neighborhoods. We want to burn them out of our neighborhoods. And if you burn the white man out, he won't come back. That was in the 60s. Ain't no white man came back here yet. Wilbur remembers the riots in 1967 and 68 as pivotal moments in the neighborhood's history. Well, before the riots, every business around here was owned by white white men. In Elmo Cafe over there, the bartender used to be Benny. After the riots came, then the man that owned the place decided he wasn't going to take care of it, so he... Gave it to Benny, I'm pretty sure, on the land contract. So Benny bought the building and the business. And after that, Benny was one of the first really successful black men in the neighborhood. And then Hudson was uh, another guy that just worked in a, in a delicate testament. And a man owned the building. Same thing happened. After the riots, he wasn't coming back. So Hudson became the second uh, most successful black man in his neighborhood. He had two restaurants, he bought several houses, and he did pretty good. And neither Benny nor Hudson taught their kids the business. And so when they got ready to retire and carry on, the kids didn't know the business. So when the kids got the business, they sold it. The next generation seemed like they just yeah. Let it go. Then, just like in towns and cities across America, in the 80s and 90s, South Cumminsville's factory shut down too. Uh, Whiteway Lighting Manufacturer down here on the corner there in uh, Elmore. It used to be a one little bitty building, about as big as that building over there. And the gentleman that started it, he kept it growing and growing and growing. And anybody in Cumminsville that wanted a job, he hired. But it seemed like after the old man passed, 
then the generation after him, it just started deteriorating. You know, the business got less and less and less. I want to say of the 450, 500 jobs that are still here in the Beekman Corridor, less than 1% of those jobs are held by people who live in the neighborhood. That's Rigel Behrens, the Community Development Planner at Working in Neighborhoods, or WIN, a Cincinnati not-for-profit founded in 1978. WIN does a lot to help South Cumminsville residents acquire affordable housing, which is in very short supply in Cincinnati. For the last 10 years, Rigel has been embedded in South Cumminsville, working with the residents, and she's been blown away by how hard they fight for the good of their community. Folks deserve, <laughs> they, they deserve to have a good neighborhood. They deserve a city that will invest in and support them while they're taking care of it. I think about how much folks have been able to accomplish and, and how hard people have to fight just to get like a new crosswalk or uh, new playground equipment at the park or um, a public restroom or a school that serves the neighborhood kids and how much effort community members have put even into their community garden. And I don't know if you got a chance to see that garden. No. It, it's it's an amazing space. I mean, it's it's got a whole fruit orchard situation going on. <laughs> I just like, and that's something that folks in the neighborhood get. Like that wasn't us going, you know, these urban orchards are all the hot stuff in the planning world. Another thing that's pretty remarkable about South Cumminsville is that every other resident here owns their own home. And to Rigel, that says a lot. To me, I think that says so much about the degree of investment that folks in this neighborhood put into their community. If you've, you know, walked down um, a lot of the streets and see the amount of pride that people have in their homes um, and how tight-knit the neighborhood is, it's an amazing uh, little neighborhood to get to work in and, and be part of and know folks. For the past few years, Rigel and her colleagues at Wynn have been knocking on doors, asking hundreds of residents of South Cumminsville and neighboring communities about what they want to see in their neighborhoods. A lot of the desires are similar. Most people want affordable housing. People want to see a flourishing business district with small businesses, like back in the day. People want the vacant lots turned into useful spaces, and they want trash and litter cleaned up. So Wynn approached different community councils and convened a meeting. The idea was that maybe they would have more success in achieving their goals as a collective. Three priorities emerged from that gathering, and they formed three working groups to spearhead those initiatives. A housing committee. You know, the housing committee was able to to negotiate this deal with the Hamilton County Land Bank to bring vacant lots that weren't being taken care of into neighborhood ownership and convince them to start a pilot program. If you lived in the neighborhood, you could get that lot for a dollar. An illegal dumping committee. They are going hard. I mean, one of the things that they did is they organized sort of hike and cleanup things. And an investment committee. The last year and a half, we've been working on like a industrial redevelopment plan with the neighborhoods collectively. Like, what do we want to see for Beekman Street? What do we envision? Where are the opportunities? What strategies can we use to do the kind of redevelopment that folks in the neighborhood want to see? We're just sort of continuing to talk to residents in the neighborhoods and, and say, all right, how do you feel about this? Is is this right? Is It's your plan. It's not the city's plan. It's your plan. I don't think I can say enough how invaluable the work that Rigel and the community members are doing. It is just so amazing how much more they're doing across community lines, across racial lines. And I've said this before, and I will say it again. Cincinnati is a city of 52 completely divided neighborhoods. And the work that people are doing on the ground is all about trying to subvert those divisions and have these communities work together to get the resources they need. 
Also, the approach that they're taking, this process that they've gone through, it is just as important as the plan itself. It, and it's also in really stark contrast to the city plans that have been inflicted on communities in Cincinnati. This approach that Rigel and her colleagues are taking is about letting community members find common challenges together and then create their own solutions and plans for how to overcome them. These efforts are all about enhancing the sense of belonging and pride that so many people in South Cummins will have already. And as we know from the story of Sarah Fawcett, that has always been a part of this community. When I was on the tour of South Cumminsville with Tim Kennedy, he took me to a little spot that, for me, epitomizes South Cumminsville's past, but also its potential future. The South Cumminsville mural. Carolyn Ann Newsom, she did this, and a lot of other people from the community did all this. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and we don't want to we don't want to change it either. We want to leave it leave it like it is. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it, it says a lot, and it's been here for a this is this is our mural of our community. The mural, which is 15 years old, will hopefully remain for decades to come, reminding the residents of South Cumminsville that they stand on the shoulders of the community heroes that came before them, reminding them that yes, there is so much rich history in the past, but also a rich future to keep fighting for. Thank you for listening to Urban Roots. We're hosted by me, Dale Hussein Wetzel, and Vanessa Quirk. We're edited by Connor Lynch. Our theme music is by Adam James Levin Arity. Story editing was by Max Miller. A big thank you to the folks who made this episode possible Tim Kennedy, Annie Williams, Alberta Warden, Scotty Lewis, Wilbur Kennedy, Derek Fagan, Sean Andres, and Rigel Behrens. Also, thanks to historians Kathy Dahl and Dr. Eric Jackson, who you heard in the first episode. If you'd like to know more about the topics that we've discussed today, then check out our website, www.urbanrootspodcast.com, where you can find blog posts and links and resources so you can dive deeper into the history that we've talked about. The Last Voices of Cincinnati series was made possible by a Truth and Reconciliation grant from Artsway. We'd also like to thank Invest in Neighborhoods for their support. They're a not-for-profit that works with Cincinnati Community Councils to create inclusive, diverse, safe, fun, and vibrant neighborhoods. To find out more about Invest in Neighborhoods and learn how you can get involved with your community council, visit investinneighborhoods.org. Thank you to Cincinnati Public Radio for this great opportunity to share these Urban Roots episodes with you all. If you enjoyed what you heard and would like to hear more Urban Roots episodes, you can find us at urbanistmedia.org, on Instagram at Urban Roots Culture, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a happy Juneteenth. Okay, I think we are officially done with this Juneteenth special. Decca, want to hit the good people of Cincinnati Public Radio with our tagline? Absolutely. Urban Roots. Looking back so we can move forward.